All right, are y'all ready to do this? Cause I am. Oh. Popping up in a little Red Bull for this Instagram Q&A session that I am thinking I might actually make a series. And as of right now, it's gonna be like answering your DMs. That's just gonna be the name of the series, A-Y-D-M-S. So welcome to technically episode number two of AYDMS, Answering Your DMs, brought to you by Red Bull. Just kidding, this is not <laughs> sponsored at all. Man, look at this flag in the background. Do you see that? Ellen, if you're watching this, I really appreciate that. So let's go ahead and get into this. The reason I'm doing this, the reason I'm doing this potential series is it's just a reason, it's an excuse for me to really sit down for like, honestly, it's not gonna be long for y'all, but for like, just sit down for like an hour or so and just answer your DMs. And then if anything I think is beneficial to you guys, I will then, you know, record my answer right here. So let's get this show on the road. Obviously, if you're not following me on Instagram or Snapchat, uh, right here. You know, I will do DM or answer questions on Snapchat or maybe even Twitter eventually, but right now, Instagram is the one where I'm falling behind, so that is where I need to catch up. All right, so I got my first question here, or I guess technically it's not the first question I've answered, but it's the first one I'm doing on the video. And I got Kenneth Hall here, who is currently a specialist, and he's in his last year of his contract, and what he wants to do is get out, do the reserves, do a college, which is gonna be great, because now your college is gonna be free, but you wanna be an officer and you want to be branched aviation. So any tips or advice for me? That is your question. So this is kind of in general for anybody who's kind of getting out of active duty, but they wanna be an officer and they're gonna go through college and do like the ROTC program or whatever. First thing that you need to note is aviation is gonna be one of the tougher branches to get into. So cyber is gonna be really tough, aviation is tough, and then I think med, the med core, uh, med services, that's also pretty tough. So if you're wanting to become an officer in a branch, that's gonna be a tough one to get into. You gotta first take into account that in becoming an officer through the RTC program, your GPA is extremely important. So you gotta get a really high GPA and I'm talking you know, like 3.7 or higher uh, if you're wanting to get into one of these more difficult branches. So you really, really need to work hard. Uh, also, your PT score is gonna be a big deal. So you gotta, you know, make sure you're trying to max out that PT score. So those are gonna be two basic things right off the bat. And I don't have too much like specific advice, right, for actually, you know, going and trying to be an aviation officer or whatever. The only thing that I do want to throw out there and mention to you, because this has been mentioned to me through uh, me going through the RTC program and then seeing other people who are trying to branch aviation and talking to all these people. And what I have been told is that it is easier to branch aviation if you go National Guard than it is active duty. So what some people do try to do is they will go through the ROTC program, they'll branch aviation in the National Guard, and then uh, they will then try to switch to active duty after that. So if that's something that you wanna do, obviously you can put active duty as your first choice, and then you can put National Guard maybe as your second choice, but that's just something I wanna throw out there. So maybe if you wanna to talk to your PMS, the professor of military science at your college that you want to go to, that's something that you should consider, because that's something I've been told. So that's my little two cents on this. All right, so here I got a question from Nate Shelby. Uh, he's got a couple questions actually. They're pretty simple and some of them I don't think I've ever talked about. So this is gonna be just a little informative thing for those of you who are curious. And he's wanting to know, number one, when do you pick your MOS? Because he's been talking to his recruiter for about a month and he still hasn't picked his MOS. And then two, when do you get your dog tags? And three, when do you get your CAC? And if you don't know what a CAC is, it's your common access card which is your military ID. So first thing here is when do you pick your MOS? Well, number one, there are people who somehow think that you can pick your MOS before you take your ASVAB. The ASVAB is literally a test to basically, number one, show whether or not you're eligible to join the military in general, and number two, what MOS are, do you qualify for? So what jobs do you qualify for? So you're not gonna be able to pick an MOS or know what MOSs you qualify for if you haven't taken the ASVAB. So number one, if you've been talking to them for about a month, uh, if you haven't taken the ASVAB, you should be able to then pick your MOS and reserve your MOS after uh, you take your ASVAB. If you've already taken the ASVAB, 
I don't know what's taking your recruiter so long or I don't know what's the issue because once you take the ASVAB and you have a valid ASVAB score, uh, then you can go and talk to the recruiter and they can pull up all the different MOSs that you qualify for and then you can pick one. And what they'll do is they'll put it on hold for like a week and then after that, that little hold that they put it on, you can then go to MEPS, then you go to MEPS, you go through the in-processing stuff and then the MEPS counselor you will sit down and actually look over your final contract and that's whenever you sign it and swear in and all that stuff so after you take the ASVAB is when you can pick your MOS and the other thing here is when do you get your dog tags uh, you get your dog tags at the end of reception or for some people it might get delayed for some crazy reason and you'll get them like the first week or whatever of basic training but you don't get them like day one of reception you should get them on the last day of reception that's when we got them but it should be kind of towards and when do you get your CAC, your military ID? Uh, I believe for us, if you go back and watch my reception video, I think it was like day two when we got our CAC. You know, reception days, things you do might vary a little bit, but you're gonna get your CAC at reception. If you are in the guard or if you are in the reserves, you might actually get your CAC beforehand. So if you can do that, go ahead and do that because you're not gonna be looking all depressed and upset with a shaved head and everything and you can have a good ID that doesn't have you as a shaved head for the next couple years or whatever uh, of your military career. So if you're in the guard or reserves, try to get your CAC beforehand. Reason being is when you join the guard and when you join the reserves, you're in the military when you first swear in. If you go active duty, you're not technically in the military until you leave for basic training. So you can't get a military ID if you're not actually in yet, but in the reserves or guard, you can. All right, I got a pretty simple one right here. I got Christopher who is joining and is leaving for basic training in 2019. So that's a little bit of a ways away, but regardless, you've you know looked up all this stuff and you're curious you know how to tell the difference between a normal sergeant versus a drill sergeant and a senior drill sergeant there's really two ways to tell apart a normal sergeant uh from a drill sergeant and number one is the campaign hat so if you have a female uh, a female drill sergeant is going to have the bill up on the side i think it's like something like australian or something or another but anyways the campaign hat is bent for the female drill sergeants and it is just a flat campaign hat which is just completely Completely different than a normal PC so that is like the you know like symbol of a drill sergeant when you look at that campaign hat the second way that you can tell is anybody who is currently a drill sergeant or used to be a drill sergeant will have a patch right right below their left chest I believe I think on their uh, their OCP uniform I believe it's a left chest so if you ever see that drill sergeant patch that looks probably like a picture that I should hopefully remember to put right here that is one way you can know that somebody is either currently a drill sergeant or they used to be a drill sergeant question that does not have anything to do with the military how many siblings do I have I have seven brothers and sisters all right so this person I'm not gonna say their name because of the question that they're asking and they're letting me know that they want to join infantry but they have a medical condition that would disqualify from them from joining the military. So he's curious or she's curious whether or not they should tell their recruiter this medical condition and hope, cross their fingers and hope that they can get a waiver for it or you know, not tell them and join the military uh, and just you know, hope that nobody finds out. The reason I'm picking this question to answer is because I get this a lot. I get medical questions all the time. Like that is a, at least half of the questions that I get are people asking me about medical issues in some way, shape or form. And so it, it's a pretty simple thing. Either you qualify to join the military or you don't. You know, it's kind of like one of those things that's just kind of like tough luck, right? So you can't control everything that happens in your life and personally, if you have a condition that would disqualify you from joining the military, I honestly do think that you should bring that up and you should tell your recruiter and try to get a waiver for it. I do not think that it is a good idea, uh, even if it's your people aren't going to find out, I do not think that it is a good idea to join the military, not tell your recruiter about a medical condition that would potentially get you uh, disqualified from joining. That is not good because you can get waiver for plenty of things, plenty of things that would disqualify somebody right off the bat. You could potentially go and push for a waiver to get that uh, you know, approved. So people will ask me all the time if this medical condition disqualifies them, if this other medical condition, all these things. I am not a doctor. 
I don't know every medical condition under the sun. I don't know all the army regulations and everything on all the medical conditions that would disqualify you or qualify you to be able to join the military. So I don't know that. So your best bet is to go and actually go through the process of trying to join, trying to go through MEPS and seeing what they say about things. If you have to get uh, jump through a few extra hoops to actually join, that's perfectly okay. You will then be fine. And if anything were to ever happen to you in your military career, and the cause of it was because of that prior medical condition that you have, because you had that on file and the military knew you had that, whenever you joined, then all your medical expenses and everything will be paid for. But let's say you lied about something, then you join, then something happens. People will have asthma, right? People with asthma will try to join. But let's say you have an asthma attack, you're doing things, you're in a dusty environment all the time, you have an asthma attack, it turns out that you had a prior condition to asthma, you knew you had that, but then you still joined and you didn't tell anybody. That's not, that's not a position that you wanna be in. Now, if you were like five years old and your mother or something dropped you and you're like, oh my gosh, and she always tells a story about how she dropped you as a baby, uh, you don't need to tell your recruiter that. I mean, personally, I think that's something that's perfectly fine. Um, so, you know, small things, people will stress about the smallest things, but there are people out there who have conditions that would disqualify them. And I say that you should tell your recruiter. So final thing that I just want to throw out here, it's not a question or anything, but I just want to shout out Private Miggins for, uh, I, it caught my eye here that you've been a subscriber and whatnot since the Shoot 'em Up 89 days. So if any of you guys have been around since my username on YouTube was Shoot 'em Up, shoot em up 89, just let me know down in the comments that you're just like an OG subscriber because you know the early days of this YouTube channel because I made that change around about 10,000, 12,000 subscribers or so. So it was a long time ago. Uh, so that that's pretty crazy. Whenever I, I see you guys who've been around for a long time, that's that's really cool to me, and I really appreciate it. So big shout out to all of you OG subscribers out there. So that is it for today's answering your direct messages. If you guys enjoyed this video, hit that like button. That would be awesome. If you want to check out some more videos, hit the subscribe button. That would be even better. If you're not following me on Instagram, Snapchat, social media links are right here. I hope you guys. Have a fantastic and amazing day, and I will see you uh, later. Drop.